Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased, uh, particularly, to be here today to uh, uh, try and talk about uh, what we're doing to join things up across the railway um, and to uh, give a more clear and consistent uh, voice or set of voices about uh, the things that we're doing and want to do. Uh, so one of the things I, I talk about a lot is the narrative about the railway and the challenge we have uh, to get more on the front foot about that narrative. Uh, and over the last few years, that narrative has, has, has evolved. Uh, and we've talked a lot about the successes uh, of our railway in this country, uh, the fact that it is uh, safest railway in Europe. Uh, we should all be terribly proud of that and, and proud, actually, of the fact that uh, whoever is the new Secretary of State in a, in a few weeks' time, it's, it's unlikely that their first question now will be what happens if there is a main incident. That used to be the first question they would ask. But we should never uh, forget uh, that, that that has changed and we should be proud of, of how that's changed. Uh, also part of that narrative is the huge growth that we've seen. So a doubling in passenger numbers over the last 20 years. And that actually means that about 800,000 people a year arriving on time, more than there were uh, a few years ago. And that's uh, uh, a testament not just to the volume, but to the reliability of the railway. We have about 29% more services running uh, than there were uh, 20 years ago. Uh, now the railway covers its day-to-day its -day running costs from uh, the industry itself. So the money that comes from government uh, is able to go into investment and improvement of the railway, uh, which is very different to where we were. And we've had this period of consensus that where investing in infrastructure and investing in the railway is seen to be a good thing. It seemed to be a politically good thing. It seemed to be good for the economy, uh, and almost got to the point where people were competing to announce uh, the next project uh, for the railway. So that's an incredible success story, but we also have to be honest about the challenges. We know there are areas uh, where performance of the railway is not as good as we'd want it to be. Uh, we know uh, there are challenges in terms of costs of part of the railway, and we can only address those things properly in partnership uh, in a joined up way across the industry. One of the other things that uh, uh, we're very clear about is that uh, as well as that, that very positive story of, of, of success and consensus, uh, there are actually uh, some big uh, issues of trust and leadership. So perception in many cases is, well, it is reality. The fact that people perceive the railway to be different to that success story matters and it is important, uh, so we need to deal with it. So customers, people who use the railway every single day, many of them do not trust the industry, that the industry is doing things the best that they possibly can for those customers, improving things for customers every single day. Uh, and we need to work to, to regain that trust. Likewise, the public perceives that there is a lack of leadership across the industry. Uh, a lot of the research we do uh, about what the public sees in the railway, not just the people who use it, but the general public, uh, says that they see that lack of leadership, they see things not being joined up, they see things being inconsistent. Uh, and so we need uh, to address that. I don't think for a moment that means we need a single person in charge. It doesn't mean we need to lose the identity of different companies. It doesn't mean that we need to diminish competition or discourage innovation. But we do need to coordinate and present a, uh, a more common uh, voice and common narrative about the future of the railway. And as well as that, the other perception that's important is, is of government. The government needs, we, the industry, need government to have confidence in the industry, confidence that we can deliver, uh, confidence that if, as a nation, we effectively say uh, that we want more services or enhancements or whatever it is, that actually the industry, the whole supply chain, is capable of delivering that uh, so that uh, we can make the strongest possible case. So the Rail Delivery Group, the organisation that I run, what it does is to bring together all of the train operating companies, uh, all of the freight operating companies, Network Rail and High Speed 2 into one place. And we bring those together to, uh, to, uh, to discuss what we can do to help improve the industry. 
uh, it really enabling the frontline businesses of the train operators and the network rail routes uh, to be more effective in delivering uh, for the end customer, uh, for the economy. They enable that transformation of the railway. So we do an awful lot of things, but I've tried to group the activities we do into a number of portfolios. And the first of those, which I'll talk about in a minute, is, is around the whole customer experience. So I'll put that to one side and come back to it. The second one is what we do as an industry to try and improve today's railway. Every single thing we do today, continuous improvement in processes uh, in the, between the network rail routes and the train operators, they're working in partnership, but with their supply chains to continuously improve performance, efficiency, uh, and the delivery of service uh, to passengers. That's the today's railway portfolio. But we need to be looking further than that into tomorrow's railway, so the whole issue is around skills, around investment, around the uh, technical strategy for the industry. Bringing together those conversations is, is the third uh, portfolio that we, we focus on. And the final one, uh, which I'll talk about again in a minute, a bit more detail, is around reform. So how do we make the industry, how it's organised, work better so it actually is collectively focused on uh, improving things for customers uh, and for the economy? But one of the things I did in order to try and help drive those portfolios together is to change the whole governance of my organisation, streamline that, uh, change the name. So you will have seen reference in the past to ATOC uh, and Rail Delivery Group. So that's now come together in one place. Rail Delivery Group is one organisation, but we support train operating companies and freight and network rail separately if necessary. So we can enable uh, freight operators to have a different point of view and express that different point of view to, to network rail if necessary and a different point of view uh, to passenger train operators. But really what we're trying to do is confront the issues between them, so get a common view wherever you can, uh, but not uh, go to the lowest common denominator uh, and where there are differences of views. You've got to flush those out and, and express them. So one of the things uh, I've done, uh, the organisation has done, is, is this uh, Britain Runs on Rail campaign. You may have seen uh, the TV adverts. Many of you see people walking around wearing the Britain Runs on Rail lapel pin. Um, you'll see the logo around the place. It's the logo everybody recognises. Um, I say the, that's, a, that's the uh, first shot from the t television advert. Uh, the seagull's name is Cyril. Um, and uh, that's the start of a campaign for us getting much more on the front foot and being to talk with more confidence about what the railway is doing, what it's delivering, what it's trying to enable for the future. Uh, but that's not uh, an end in its own right. Actually, the part of the reason we want to do that is to so that we can have some of the really difficult conversations about the future, where the difficult choices to be made about investment or about fares or other issues, where we want to have a more open and public and transparent debate uh, rather than uh, it just being uh, done behind closed doors. So it, it, it's trying to give us permission for that grown-up conversation about the future of the railway. So I'm very proud of that, that advert and, and, and look to see us building on that and I'll say a bit more in, in the future. So I said I'd talk a bit about customer experience because really uh, this has to be at the heart of everything we do in our mindset and, and if we're honest as an industry it hasn't always been that way. Uh, so in, in my organisation uh, we have a, 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 an important team which is, is trying to provoke that debate constantly. Uh, and one of the things we've tried to do there is, is to get more of an evidence-based approach to understanding what the customer wants from the railway and how that differs from what we're delivering today. So you can see in some areas that actually we're delivering very well against what the customer wants. In other areas, uh, we're a long way off uh, from what customer uh, wants from and expects from the railway uh, as, as, as its supplier. So that heartbeat, as we call it, the customer heartbeat, is driving the actual things that we're doing to try and help train operators and network rail to improve customer experience, to coordinate that where necessary, but still to enable individual operators to innovate and drive their own customer's experience. So we're trying to get more constant, real-time measurement of customer feedback around that. Uh, traditionally, we've had annual surveys and information, but actually we're trying to get much more real-time feedback 
so that uh, operators can respond to that and change what they're doing in response to what customers are saying about the service they receive. The, um, one of the areas where I think expectations have changed enormously in terms of customer experience is around accessibility. Uh, the level of expectation, quite rightly, uh, for people with disabilities is enormously higher than it used to be. And it's a big challenge and also a big opportunity for the industry to provide uh, what people rightly expect in that area uh, to really address some of the difficult issues about the, the, in some cases, ancient infrastructure we have, but to be able to use that in a way which is much more accessible to many people. Uh, people don't want to be defined by uh, their own circumstances. They want to be able to use the railway in the same way that anybody else can uh, and to have that independence. And that's, that's the opportunity and challenge we have uh, to address that, uh, that need. But I don't think uh, we're there yet. An issue that I'm constantly asked about in the context of trust uh, is around how, to de how we deal with passenger complaints. Uh, and actually, uh, we, the industry train operators, as my members, are very keen to support the establishment of an independent uh, rail ombudsman if that's, uh, if that's what's decided. So we've been working to uh, understand what that might look like uh, if that's the, the decision of whoever uh, comes into government. Uh, that independence of, of dealing with complaints and disputes, I think, is incredibly important to give people uh, the trust uh, that they, uh, they deserve in the service that's being provided for them. By far the most toxic, if you like, issue in, in many of my conversations with customers and the public is around fares. Uh, the fare system that we have today is the result of ancient history um, that was locked into stone at 1995 in the fares that have to be provided by the industry uh, uh, in terms of each station uh, and the structure of fares that exists. Uh, but changing that is incredibly hard. I don't say that to provide as an excuse, but because we need to be honest about the fact we need to have a difficult conversation about winners and losers. If you change fares, there will be winners and losers. Uh, and that's a difficult conversation that we need to be honest about. We can't go into it uh, in a big bang and, and change everything. So what we've done is to uh, introduce three important pilots uh, that I think will create the momentum uh, for changes in the fare structure. Uh, so that we can address some of the anomalies that people rightly point out and, and we have to try and explain why it is the case uh, that you can get something cheaper doing it one way or another way, going one route or another way. Uh, it doesn't make sense to the public and it undermines uh, the trust in the railway. Uh, so that's why we're so passionate about those pilots and showing what can be done uh, to reform the fare system. Building on all of that is, is the whole concept of industrial strategy. In a lot of the speeches today, you'll hear reference to industrial strategy. Uh, and I think it's a really fantastic opportunity, actually, uh, to, to re-energize and re-emphasize a lot of the things that in the industry uh, we know could help us all to improve things for customers, help us to improve things to enable economic growth, enable us to deliver better and better uh, services and better value. A critical part of all of that is around skills. Um, there's around 100,000 jobs to estimate to be created in, in uh, job opportunities in the next decade uh, in the railway industry. Huge opportunities uh, for people to come and work in, in, in what is, a, is an incredibly exciting industry uh, uh, where there are uh, new and diverse skills. Uh, around 20,000 apprentices uh, needed I I within a, a year or so. Uh, so a huge opportunity for new and young people to come into the railway with different uh, jobs, in many cases different jobs uh, to the ones that they perceive. Uh, but we certainly have some challenges in doing that. Um, talking about leadership, interestingly, I a slide on leadership. Uh, if you Google leadership, what you get typically is a picture of men doing high fives. Uh, and that it was a reflection of the diversity of the leadership uh, culture that we have, not just in this industry, uh, but across the economy. But certainly, I think, in some cases, it's worse in this industry. So really promoting uh, that diversity is, is important. Um, I was invited to another conference recently in, in, in a European country, which I shan't name, and there was a ladies' programme. 
uh, where the ladies, so supposedly partners of the uh, important leaders from different railway industries across Europe, uh, were invited to go and uh, see some interesting sites around the city. So these are examples of how we as an industry need to modernise and change our culture in order to uh, attract the sort of talent we need uh, to improve uh, the railway that we have today. But I do think we have some fantastic, unique selling points as, as a UK railway and the UK railway supply chain. The diversity uh, and the passion and the uh, breadth and depth of the uh, uh, things you see around today are really testament to that and the opportunity we have to exploit that. Uh, we are better than anywhere, I would say, at exploiting uh, old infrastructure and, and making the best out of that to deliver the better services and eking more and more capacity out of that for capacity. That's a unique thing that we have developed in this country on the back of uh, us having created railways across the many, many countries in the past. And going forward, the opportunity is to build on that even more and develop digital rail products and technology and apply that in a way that actually we need more than other countries now, but they will need in the future. So the opportunity for us is to get ahead of that in real implementation of that technology and then uh, for us and our supply chain to exploit that elsewhere. So I think that whole conversation about uh, industrial strategy is, is exciting one. And the prospect of a sector deal is an even more exciting one, uh, where a deal involves somebody giving something and asking something from something else. Uh, and my view would be that the industry has the opportunity to come together and present itself in a coordinated, a cohesive way to government and to ask things of government in what it can do uh, to help us all to deliver better for customers and for the economy. So some of the things uh, we're doing to improve the railway already um, I think are important. It's context of industrial strategy. We talk about strategy and, and actually sometimes uh, our version of strategy is the next few years. It might be a franchise period or a control period. Uh, success will come when we see those, those five-year or 15-year periods as tactical and actually the strategy is about the real longer term of where we're trying to work towards. That's what success looks like. So strategy is way out there and these five-year periods are seen as the tactical interventions to get us towards that strategy uh, rather than uh, tactics is today and strategy might be next year. That's not real strategy. Uh, that's what we need uh, from government, but it's what we as an industry need to uh, give government and shape that strategy and help them and say, well, if you were to do this for us, then we can deliver this for you. But already today we're delivering huge investment, the industry's whole delivering uh, huge investment, uh, 50 billion railway upgrade program uh, in this five-year period, around 11 billion of that is trains. Um, around five and a half thousand new carriages being introduced, around six and a half thousand uh, new train services uh, per week over the next four years. Uh, so huge growth still being delivered on the railway, uh, but a huge challenge, uh, an opportunity for us all to do it uh, more and more effectively. And that leads us on to the, uh, uh, the reform uh, portfolio, which I mentioned earlier. So really important parts of all of that and the vision we'd have uh, of actually enabling really vibrant markets throughout the railway industry uh, in this country so that they can work in a joined up way, not in an incons inconsistent way, uh, and, uh, uh, and deliver for customers and the economy. So that means recognizing that actually there are multiple companies in the industry. There will always be multiple companies. We want them to compete and innovate, uh, to con create contestability, but do it in a joined up way uh, with clear uh, requirements. So actually what we're working towards uh, in having one railway with one team uh, it doesn't mean a single leader, as I said, it doesn't mean a single identity, it doesn't mean reduced competition, it doesn't mean moving to a lowest common denominator, it doesn't mean killing innovation. What it does mean is more coordination and clearer asks of government, clearer communication to the public uh, and to customers. Uh, ultimately what it means, one railway, one team, competing together, working together, enabling innovation uh, for customers and for the economy. Uh, because as I said earlier, Britain runs on rail.
Thank you very much. Paul, well, thank you very much indeed. We do have time for a couple of questions. If anyone has uh, something that they'd ask to like, like, like to ask Paul Power. Uh, your challenge, Paul, is, is, is pulling everything together um, from the mainline railway point of view. Now, when you talked about at the beginning that you represent the train operators, the freight operators, network rail, and so on, of course, Transport for London operates a major railway network in this country. Um, and then there are some regional ones like uh, Transport for Greater Manchester, Tyne and Weir, and so on. What connection does um, Rail Delivery Group have with, with those uh, organisations so that you can have one whole united railway industry? Uh, well, the, um, setting aside London Underground, which because TFL operates the whole integrated system from uh, specifier to uh, the operation of London Underground, but the, the mainline train services they operate are part of our membership. Uh, likewise, other, other train operators around the country uh, that aren't just contractors to DFT are part of our membership. So it, it is joined up in that sense. But I do think uh, the opportunity to, to join that up even further and to join up with the supply chain uh, even further is, is is certainly an opportunity that we're working on. And political devolution is an important part of that. So DFT uh, has a massively important role to play in, in relation to the strategy, but it is not the only show in town in terms of specifying what's delivered locally in regional markets. TfL is, is the biggest of that, but we're seeing uh, much more other players uh, d developing in terms of what they want in their local markets to serve their local customers, enable their local economies, but we still have to join it up as a network, make it seamless for customers. Customers, and that's what I try to do. Good, thank you. We have one question down here. We'll get you a, we'll get you a microphone, which I think is at the back, so I'll have to hand you mine. If you could just tell us who you are, so and ask your question. Um, I'm, I'm Richard Maidens. I'm long-term railway member. Won't tell you how many years, but it's an awful lot. Um, throughout my railway career, we've had repeated struggles over train manning. I can recount all the strikes that we had in the R days. Uh, we now have um, a problem with the RMT, which I think Southern have taken the brunt of, but it's affecting other talks. Uh, is there any RDG leadership in how we're going to have to tackle the RMT stance on train manning, which seems to me intractable at the moment, and I don't think can be solved by any one talk on their own. So I didn't catch the end? I don't think any one talk can solve it on their own. Is there some leadership coming from your end on this? Uh, I, I, I like to think so. Um, so uh, I've been uh, quite uh, clear, I hope, that uh, we see uh, it really critical that whole railway needs to modernise. It needs to uh, be able to use modern technology, modern working practices, ultimately to deliver uh, better for customers and to enable the economy. Uh, and that, that is actually incredibly exciting for uh, people working in the railway because there are many, many thousands more jobs, not less jobs, uh, that we need to deal with uh, the growth opportunities that we see uh, and actually they're, they're higher skilled jobs in many cases uh, many cases more customer facing roles different sorts of roles but there's no doubt we need more people um, we need different skills and we need to support training and development. So that conversation should be a really positive conversation uh, that we're wanting to have, all of the railway companies wanting to have with their own workforce, but actually we also need to be having with, with the unions. So that's what we've been uh, trying to do uh, increasingly. Uh, and I think perhaps in terms of the public narrative, getting across that actually this is about modernising the railway um, and to deliver for customers, deliver the economy, and it's not threatening to jobs, creates opportunity for jobs. It's something we didn't do enough early on in the process, but we've certainly been trying to do more and more uh, recently. Thank you very much. My, my name is uh, Ghani. I'm a, a railway man, but I'm run, now retired. And uh, I suppose uh, having retired, I need to get out a bit more because I need so. Um, uh, but uh, the, my question really, and uh, the thing that bothers me is that we really need from you now a kind of very clear vision for the whole system as a whole. And, and that vision would be something which other parts of the, um, the, the railway fraternity has to buy into it. And that includes the trade unions, because I think the whole system has to buy into that vision for where is the railways going. 
what is going to happen in, in this country in terms of the whole transport system. And railways are going to remain a very important part of it. So it, it's really the important thing is to have that very clear and simple vision to put it across. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree more. So uh, I think uh, increasingly the, the public recognises how important the railway is to uh, not just customers who use it, but to the economy, and that's been a really important conversation. Uh, increasingly, uh, we're, we're trying to get across that we need to modernise the railway uh, and invest, and that's a positive thing rather than a threatening thing. Uh, I think in terms of the reform agenda, increasingly we recognise that there are multiple companies and we need to join up and, and present uh, government with what, what we could deliver and ask them very clearly what, what, what it is we need to help them. So I, th I, I agree absolutely in presenting that vision. We, don't, we need to be coordinated as an industry, uh, presented in a simple and clear way uh, about the sort of journey we can, we can take people on. Okay, thank you for that. We have one, one in the middle. We'll just one more, t one more time. That one. He was. Uh, good morning. My name is Colin Sordon, and the company is Integrated Sky. You, uh, it would seem that your focus is in entirely on heavy rail. Where do trams and metros fit in? Um, in terms of, uh, I, I think that's. I can understand why you say that. In terms of planning and thinking about transport solutions, the overall system, I don't think that's how we approach it. So I certainly don't sit here saying, well, actually, heavy rail is the answer to all the problems. And I think uh, I would certainly be critical of some of the past decisions and, and attitudes where people think, well, heavy rail is the answer. What's the question? Um, but, but having said that, in terms of thinking what the transport solution should be, heavy rail is very effective in some uh, problems and we need to focus on those areas where it is really good and deliver that really really well uh, enable interaction and interface with other modes lighter rail trams buses and other things and 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 in in the modern world of of, uh, of information and technology and how how we all as, as customers uh, interact with transport systems recognize that actually putting information out there and enabling um, innovation and technology to to bring uh, the different modes together I think is, is really exciting. So what, what we deliver is unashamedly focused on heavy rail. How we think about what we should deliver I think needs to be much more holistic than that, much more integrated. We're doing just have time for the last one, please. Good morning, Julian Symbol from Cadenza Transport Consulting. As we look ahead uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, what we see is a, a new form of transport emerging in the form of uh, driverless vehicles. Um, now, given how long it's taken us to get towards ERTMS level two um, and how slow digital railway seems to be going, um, do you see the rise and probable inevitability of driverless cars as a threat to the industry? Uh, personally, no, I don't actually. I think it's an incredibly exciting opportunity and, uh, and it, it, about providing that integration and, and dealing with focusing where the railway does what the railway is really, really good at, which is longer distance, mass uh, 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 transit uh, and freight uh, and, and creating the interface with other modes of transport, including driverless cars, where my car will take me from my home to my st station and then drive home and park back in the car, car park, whatever it does. Uh, in a completely different way. I think that's a fantastic opportunity for the railway. If you think about the constraints, for example, on my railway line at the moment, increasingly it's not about the track or about the trains, it's about the car parks, it's about getting to the station. I think that uh, opportunity in terms of uh, driverless trains and other modes of transport to your, your previous question is, is a positive thing that we need to exploit and join up with uh, rather than something we should be scared of. Right, well, thank you very much, Dick Paul. That's a, a great vision of uh, having your car drop you at the station and drive itself home again. I think that's a marvellous idea.